Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, Gathered here in one strong body, Gathered here in the struggle and the power, Spirit draw near. Welcome to this gathering of people, to this community of humans from all ages and stages of life. We are committed to being with each other as we face the great questions of how to live a life of meaning, how to love inclusively, how to grow in body, mind, or spirit, and how to do our part to create a more just and more whole world. Welcome. This is Worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes, and it is my great joy to serve as the minister along with this beloved community. It is so good to be together. As part of our welcome, we also acknowledge our history and deeper context. This lands are the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They created their lives here long before any of us arrived. And part of how we continue our legacies of all that has been and all that we hope to achieve is that we are sustained and supported by the time, treasure, and talent of the members and friends of the congregation. Financial donations sustain the mission and make it possible for us to gather in all the ways, online and in person. The link to make a donation is in the chat, and it will also be in the slide at the end of the service. If you are a guest or a visitor, you are very welcome. I'm so glad to see you. Please help us get to know you as well. All are invited to our conversation after the Sunday service. The link for the separate Zoom is in the chat, and it's also in the chat uh, in the slide at the end of the service. Contact us through the website for more information. And I also want to offer a special note of thanks to Terry Malone, who offered our uh, altar decorations for this month. Thank you, Terry. And now, as we enter into worship, uh, we have a special message from Nora Sullivan about our annual campaign. Good morning. What a beautiful spring day. My name is Nora Sullivan. I'm here on behalf of the annual pledge campaign. I've been on the board of directors for the past six years, and it's certainly been a time of change and challenge. We've said goodbye to two beloved ministers, and we've welcomed a new, vibrant, dynamic minister who will help lead us into the future. We've also experienced a pandemic the likes of which we have never seen. And it's brought challenges to all of us as to how we stay together, even when we're apart. And thanks to the staff, the admin team, we've been doing a good job of that. We have wonderful streamed services. We have Flocknote. We have mailings, we have the newsletter, emails, and special events that, while different, have been great. They've been fun. We're looking at hiring a new additional staff person for the coming fiscal year so that we can continue to find new ways to communicate and keep in touch. And it will relieve our staff that have been doing this all on their own, which has been a mighty effort. I hope that you will value everything the church has done to keep us together when we're apart. And I hope you'll remember to look at the pledge material that you've been sent and to make an effort to mail it in so that we can continue our goals and our missions for the coming year. Because this church means a lot to all of us. It's who we are and it's where we wanna be. And we're counting on each other to make sure that we continue to be strong as we go through and see what the future holds for us. So thank you. It's been great talking to you. Continue to enjoy a beautiful day. Bye now. Come the fount of every blessing, tune our hearts to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. While the hope of life's perfection fills our hearts with joy and love, teach us ever to be faithful. May we still thy goodness prove. Come, thou fount of every vision, lift our eyes to what may come. See the lion and the young lamb. 
Ourselves by Gordon B. McKeeman. We summon ourselves from the demands and the delights of the daily round, from the dirty dishes and unwaxed floors, from unmown grass and untrimmed bushes, from the incompletenesses and the not yet startednesses, from the unholy and the unresolved. We summon ourselves to attend to our vision of peace and justice of cleanliness and health, of delight and devotion, of the lovely and the holy, of who we are and what we can do. We summon the power of tradition and the acceleration of newness for wisdom of the ages and the knowing of the very young. We summon beauty, eloquence, poetry, and music to be the bearers of our dreams. We would open our eyes, our ears, our minds, our hearts to the amplest dimensions of life. We rejoice in manifold promises and possibilities. May this flame by Betts Winecki. May this flame, symbol of transformation since time began, fire our curiosity, strengthen our wills, and sustain our courage as we seek what is good within us and around us. Good morning. I'd like to start my time with you today with an act of community for us as you use. As part of our annual Children's Fruit and Chocolate Communion, which we hope will again be part of our coming year, our UU kids recite the seven UU rainbow principles which links every current UU principle with a letter that starts with the color of the rainbow. Today, I'd like to begin by calling out each color and principle in our rainbow principles so we can all hear and reflect on them together. Okay, here goes. Red, respect all beings. Orange, offer fair and kind treatment to all. Yellow, yearn to learn. Green, grow in spirit and mind. Blue, believe in your ideas and act on them. Indigo, insist on peace, freedom, and justice. And violet, value the connections in creation. These principles are the words that show what we value as Unitarian Universalists. These words are meant to help guide us as we make decisions in our lives. But when it really comes down to it, the old saying, talk is cheap, is true. If we only talk about what we value, we don't really change anything about ourselves or the world. That's why even while we've been physically apart, members of our church family have worked really hard to be the change that we want to see in the world. Let me share just a few examples of our principles in action last year. We showed our respect for all beings by caring for and valuing the safety of all in our community near and far during this time of crisis. We offered fair and kind treatment to all by collecting hundreds of books for the Books to Prisoners program. 
We yearned to learn as we connected with other UU churches in central Illinois to learn more about widening our circle of concern for racial justice. We believed in our ideas and acted on them. When our church members talked to their lawmakers and partnered with like-minded organizations and churches in Peoria to help make our community and its policing more safe and fair. We insisted on peace, freedom, and justice as our church's members joined in a nationwide get out the vote campaign to help every voice be heard. And we valued the connections in creation through working to save our natural prairie and taking care of our own precious church land. I definitely believe that what makes us a community of Unitarian Universalists is not only our shared seven principles and the promises we make to each other, but also our joint commitment to living those principles out in the world. We all know that open minds and loving hearts are precious, but it's our helping hands living out our principles that truly change the world. Let's continue to be the change together, no matter what the future brings. Maybe even another UU principle. So be it. The next story is a short introduction to the question of the eighth principle. This eighth principle was written in 2013 as a way of directly speaking to racism and oppression. This recommended eighth principle is being voted on by congregations across the country, and it may be approved to be added to the official list of our principles. I want to share that uh, eighth principle as it's written now, and you'll hear it again later in the service. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community, by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. The story about why we need the eighth principle is created by Meg McGuire, a student at the Unitarian Universalist Seminary, Star King School for the Ministry in Berkeley, California. What is the eighth principle? Well, you know our seven principles, right? They're things that matter to us. Things that guide how we are as a community, how we treat each other, and what we want to bring more of into the world. Just like each of us is always learning and growing, we know our principles have to grow sometimes too. This is the story of the eighth principle. A few years ago, some UU leaders spoke up. They told us these principles we love, they left something out. Like many who'd come before them, they spoke about how people still aren't being treated fairly because of the color of their skin or where they come from or other things that make them who they are. And that happens not only in the world at large, but even in our congregations, even in this one. So we need to do more to make sure that all people can feel welcome and loved here. We need to say more about our commitments to fight against racism because racism hurts everybody. In fact, it hurts all seven of our principles. And so, the eighth principle was born. The eighth principle is a commitment to fight against racism and oppression and to build a beloved community of love and trust and belonging here in our church and in the world around us. We're going to be talking about the Eighth Principle a lot this spring, learning about it and what it means for this community. What does the Eighth Principle mean to you?
From the Reverend Kristen Harper. I do not wish to breathe another breath if it is not shared with others. The breath of life is not mine alone. I brought myself to be with you, hoping that by inhaling the compassion, the courage, the hope I found here, I can exhale the fear, the selfishness, the separateness I keep so close to my skin. I cannot live another moment, at least not one of joy, unless you and I find our oneness somewhere among each other, somewhere between the noise, somewhere within the silence of the next breath. This is the time for sharing the joys and sorrows of the congregation. I want to thank Shar Ricky for collecting them. And I begin with joy. We offer our congratulations to Nancy Rakoff as she celebrates the birth of a new great-granddaughter. Ileana Sonnemaker was born on April 29th. Congratulations to the entire family. And now I move to wishes for health. We send wishes for complete and speedy recoveries to Henry Curran, who is recovering at home from an injury in a fall and also to Dave Grebner, who is also at home recovering from a fall. We offer our care and concern additionally to Dave Grebner, who has a sister and a cousin, each with health concerns. And now I turn to sorrow. We offer our heartfelt sympathy to Brenda Miller. Uh, she mourns the loss of her sister, Mary Kimball. Mary passed on April 20th at age 61. We also offer our sympathy to Brenda as she mourns the death of her brother, John Kuntz. He passed on February 7th at age 56. And in our larger world, we offer our prayers and thoughts and best wishes to the nation of India in their particular hardship and struggle with COVID. Let's take one more moment to breathe. As Reverend Harper says, I brought myself to be with you. We bring our whole selves with all of our beauty, with all of our flaws, with our entirely broken selves and broken hearts. Let us share one more moment. Let us be present to the life within us, to the life around us, and to all the joys and sorrows that live in our hearts and in the world. Let us hold one more moment 
in quiet. Amen. And now uh, we have our reading, which is offered by Jean Burke. He presents our seven principles as they are now, and the eighth principle, the one that's proposed. Our seven principles are a way to describe our essential commitments. Members from congregations agreed to them in 1985 and 1986. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, acceptance of one another and encouragement in spiritual growth in our congregations, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Unitarian Universalists across the country are studying a possible eighth principle some congregations have voted in favor of adding it to the list. The eighth principle reads, we, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying toward spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. As we start this month and our theme of story, I begin with belief, articulating what is most dear. And my first encounter with articulating uh, my sense of faith it started pretty quietly in some ways with a poster at church. Now, I must have been about 13 or 14 years old. Uh, I was deep in the congregational life. 
where I grew up at the Univer Unitarian Universalist Church in Worcester, Massachusetts. I had bonded with the congregation when I was about eight. I mean, I was in. These people were my people. I had an embodied sense of being part of the faith and part of the congregation. I also wanted to feel more able to share the good stuff of my experience with other people, with my classmates, if it came up. But I didn't always know how to summarize my values and beliefs when asked or on occasion confronted. So I sought guidance from the congregation. I, I wanted something official, you know, some kind of statement that was endorsed by the adults. I needed words to speak to what we shared uh, that would serve as a platform for talking with my friends, helping me be confident that I could respond. For example, when a classmate called me a heathen. And I really wanted talking points to promote the good stuff that informed my life and who, was, who I was becoming. So I walk into church one day and I see this poster. And it said, we, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, do covenant to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth, and the free and responsible search for truth and meaning, and on and on, all those seven great principles. And this poster, it also was appealing. It was on a peachy tan paper, dark lettering. It was in script. It was elegant. It was well-designed. It looked real. And it was on the wall of the church as I entered the main door. At the moment that I needed one, here was an answer. Now, I knew these weren't the only words. There's no fixed expression or definition of faith in Unitarian Universalism, no one was going to demand that I abide by them. That much I certainly knew in congregational life. And with these words, I felt equipped. I felt I could be in the world as a Unitarian Universalist and have a solid location. With these words, I felt more invested this is who I am. This is who we are. I claim this and it claims me. In faith development, there is an early moment when we have wandered and wondered and lived and practiced. We've been testing and wanting and exploring and then choosing, naming. We've been claiming, uh, we've caught and absorbed the priorities, often of those around us, and agreed. You know, I'm in. As time goes on, humans have more than one instance, usually, of wondering and questioning and claiming as well. Uh, for many of us, this cycle repeats again and again. I know those of us who found Unitarian Universalism as adults uh, certainly have this experience in spades. I recognize the significance uh, of these, uh, these seven principles have for so many uh, folks I've spoken with in this congregation and also in all of my experience who may have encountered one or all of these principles and some, something inside said, yes, inherent worth, that we're all part of a web of existence. There is a search for truth and meaning and so much more. But what's also true is that these principles were, were written. They have a beginning. And it's not necessarily far, as far back as one might think. Uh, these come from the 1980s. They, these principles didn't exist. Uh, you know, in some ways, they didn't exist before I encountered them uh, for very long. In, in one sense, that poster was brand new. Uh, it was new in the faith as well as in the church. Members of, the con of congregations all over the country had gone through a multi-year process of writing and discussing and voting and finally approving them in 1985 
and they showed up in our churches after that. These principles have been with us for over 30 years. And before that, there was another statement that kind of uh, was defined, another set of principles, six principles, that defined the Unitarian Universalist Association at its beginning in 1961. Uh, that list of statements, um, it started with the free and disciplined search for truth as a foundation for our religious fellowship. There was individual dignity in those principles as well, also world of justice and peace, relations between congregations being a priority. Um, all the so many pieces of our current principles were found in those earlier six. And before 1961, the American Unitarian Association and the Universalist Church of America, they each had their own declarations of values and core statements as well. We keep reviewing and revising in every age. Now these seven principles uh, that we have now, they are one of the most common and accessible ways to talk about Unitarian Universalism. They weren't meant to be the, fin the definitive final word either. They've held up pretty well. We've debated, we've argued, we've disagreed. Some folks have definitely come to the place of, of profound uh, other ways of understanding inherent worth, for example. I still return to them, uh, even at this point in ministry. I know many of you do as well. We kind of pick up on a phrase or two, kind of bringing it out as learned poetry, as a little bit of, of scripture, if you will, to evoke, to call in uh, as a reminder of covenant, as a reminder of our profound promises, and and as a common language to help us remember that we are not alone in our liberal religious effort. But the practice of them is a constant practice as well. In living with them, we've had more chance to consider them uh, and where to go from here, because the practice and the exploration, that keeps going. So I want to talk about uh, part of that exploration. Um, I want to talk about the effort to add another principle, an eighth principle. So I will say at the outset, uh, we're not under any particular schedule to consider and to rush and to vote. Um, we have yet to have a, a, a plan, for example, for officially bringing this to the congregation. We have a chance at this point to learn and engage for ourselves. Congregations across the country are taking up the question of reviewing the principles and adding one more. And it's important to begin now as this congregation continues and expands racial justice work and as we prepare to participate in the annual meeting of Unitarian Versalists across the country at our annual gathering, our General Assembly in June. Let me say a little bit about the origin of where this eighth principle comes from. About 10 years ago, there seemed to be a real need for something more. Paula Cole Jones uh, is on the staff of the Mid-Atlantic area in our association. And as an African-American woman and as a, in her role as director of racial and social justice, uh, Paula worked with all kinds of congregations uh, and drew on a combination of the seven principles and a sense of the beloved community. You know, how do we create a more whole world? And she found uh, in all of her, in her years of work, she found that people could be entirely consistent with being a good you, you, if you would, a good you, you, um, and being entirely in line with our seven principles without directly adjusting directly addressing uh, racial injustice or forms of oppression on a larger systemic scale. So she started a conversation with folks from her region and the eighth principle came into being in 2013. Uh, at that time, the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Restoration in Philadelphia adopted this eighth principle into their covenant. And in 2017, they adopted it formally as an addition to their list of principles 
and recommended that the UUA do so as well. So here I say again, the eighth principle. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. Now, since 2017, congregations across the country have been studying this eighth principle. Many have added it to their own public statements. Uh, members and friends of this congregation are beginning to work with this principle uh, as we continue our racial and social justice uh, efforts, uh, following on the study just completed of widening the circle of concern. So it's beginning to show up among us. The seven principles that we already have, already are approved and have had for quite some time, they cover so much. Uh, the individual and the universal, our search, our desire for justice, our hope for peace and living in a world community. Just three of those, you know, valuing the individual, understanding our relationship with all that is, and being open to new truth, those three are essential theological claims, part of what helps define us. And at the same time, there are some things that need additional focus, in this case, race. As congregations who benefit from right, white privilege, work on race and oppression can be an option, a choice. But for so many of us in our congregations and in our society, bias is a daily reality, not a choice. In a country that's structured around the benefits of racism, it's time to actively address those structures and find other ways. Doing so, doing this work, is certainly fulfilling the potential of our principles. And doing so with the eighth principle kind of right in front of us helps keep it also on the page, helps make sure that we, are, we keep using this as our lens. I want to offer uh, another way that the eighth principle is phrased, um, as we've done a little bit with rephrasing the seven principles for different ages. Um, another way to think of the eighth principle is, we promise to build a safe and welcoming community free of racism and oppression. That's the heart of it. We promise to build a safe and welcoming community free of racism and oppression. And we can enter into this work now, not just because other congregations are doing so and because this is a conversation of our faith, but we are also in this moment of getting ready for the next chapter in our, in our social lives, in our lives in this next chapter from the pandemic. And answer that question of what kind of country do we want to be? In this past year, we've had terrible new lessons about race and class and health, life and death questions. Who has access to wealth and health care? Who gets justice? Who is actively harmed or killed in the normal that was? And who is actively harmed or killed in the normal that continues? For example, in the same hour as George Floyd's murderer heard uh, the guilty verdict, police shot and killed a black teenage girl who had called them for help. What shall our new normal be like? We have a chance to take to heart the commitment and opportunity to shift systems and fulfill our mission. This month's theme is story, and these questions about principles is our story. We begin with our ethical, principled, moral work, and the practice gets to be a spiritual one as well. As Rebecca Parker makes an essential point about why, why anti-racism is spiritual work, she says, this is my country. Love calls me beyond denial and disassociation. 
It is not enough to think of racism as a problem of human relations, to be cured by me and others like me, treating everyone fairly, with respect and without prejudice. Racism is more. It is a problem of segregated knowledge, mystification of facts, anesthetization of feeling, exploitation of people, and violence against the common, the community of our humanity. She goes on, my commitment to racial justice is both on behalf of the neighbor, uh, my neighbor whose well-being I desire, and for myself, to whom the gift of life has been given, yet not fully claimed. I struggle neither as a benevolent act of social concern, nor as a repentant act of shame and guilt, but, but, as an act of desire for life, a passion for life, of an insistence for life, fueled by both love and anger in the face of violence that divides human flesh. I, I am in the work because I am engaged with life. That's the story I want to tell. That's the story that comes out of these conversations. I am fully part of and a participant in this world and I know that matters to you too. And those seven principles, seeing them called me into life, this possibility of the eighth moves that forward that much more. These principles, the seven that have been with us since the 1980s, have served as a foundation and an aspiration for so many of our values. They have been an outward sign to calling people to yes. And that yes also evolves as we practice and live what is most dear and pay attention to the struggles that are real with us, with our neighbors, and with all of our fellow humans. As we offer our best selves to create a more just, more compassionate, and more peaceful world, another principle, this principle, this eighth one can help us name and claim that anti-racist, anti-oppressive, multicultural community that can be, that could be, that we want it to be. There will be more to hear and learn and ponder on the way. But let this be our beginning, to be called back into life after so many months of separation and despair. Let us let it be a calling back for that, but also because this is our work. This helps us fulfill our mission, helps us fulfill our promises to meet those promises that we've been making for so long, that have come from so long ago, and that continue. We get to continue them forward into the future. So let us begin. Amen. And our closing hymn is Shine On Me. Melanie Damore invites us into restoration to take in the light and the love around us from all the sources in our lives. I invite you to enter into a yes for our hymn, Shine On Me. Shine on me, oh, shine on me. Let the light from the lighthouse shine on me, oh, shine on me. Yes, shine on me. Let the light from the lighthouse shine on me. Lift me up, oh, lift me up. Let the light from the lighthouse lift me up. Oh, lift me up, yes, lift me up. Let the light 
from the lighthouse. Lift me up. Oh, hold, hold me close. Yes, hold me close. Let the light from the lighthouse hold me close. Yes, hold me close, so oh, hold me close. Let the light from the lighthouse please hold me close. Oh, shine, shine on me, shine on me. Yes, shine on me. Let the, light Let the light from the lighthouse shine on me. Oh, shine on me. Yes, shine on me. Let the light from the lighthouse shine. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And now let us go forth. The world aches for us to join together and bring about healing, toil for justice, and produce an ever-expanding love. This is our calling. May we go forth that we may fulfill our yes to life and our yes to creating a beautiful, more whole, more beloved community. So may it be. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. Mm -hmm.